Episode 11 of Space Prison by Tom Godwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Space Prison, Episode 11 The first rays of sunrise were coming into the room, revealing fully the frail thinness of the pups, when there was a step outside and Julia's voice. Father? Come in, Julia, he said, not moving. She entered, still a pale shadow of the reckless girl who had fought a unicorn, even though she was slowly regaining her normal health. She carried young Johnny in one arm, in her other hand his little bottle of milk. Johnny was hungry, there was never quite enough milk for him, but he was not crying. Ragnarok children did not cry. She saw the pups, and her eyes went wide. Prowlers! Baby prowlers! Where did you get them? He told her, and she went to them, to look at them and say, If you and their father hadn't helped each other that day, they wouldn't be here, nor you, nor I, nor Johnny, none of us in this room. They won't live out the day, he said. They have to have milk, and there isn't any. She reached down to them, and they seemed to sense that she was someone different. They stirred, making tiny whimpering sounds, and tried to move their heads to nuzzle at her fingers. Compassion came to her face, like a soft light. "'They're so young,' she said. "'So terribly young to have to die.' She looked at Johnny and at the little bottle that held his too small morning ration of milk. "'Johnny, Johnny,' her words were almost a whisper, you're hungry, but we can't let them die. And some day, for this, they will fight for your life. She sat on the bed and placed the pups in her lap beside Johnny. She lifted a little black head with gentle fingers, and a little pink mouth ceased whimpering as it found the nipple of Johnny's bottle. Johnny's gray eyes darkened with the storm of approaching protest. Then the other pup touched his hand, crying in its hunger, and the protest faded as surprise and something like sudden understanding came into his eyes. Julia withdrew the bottle from the first pup and transferred it to the second one. Its crying ceased, and Johnny leaned forward to touch it again, and the one beside it. He made his decision with an approving sound and leaned back against his mother's shoulder, patiently awaiting his own turn, and their presence accepted as though they had been born his brother and sister. The golden light of the new day shone on them, on his daughter and grandson and the prowler pups, and in it he saw the bright omen for the future. His own role was nearing its end, but he had seen the people of Ragnarok conquer their environment insofar as Big Winter would never let it be conquered. The last generation was being born, the generation that would meet the Gurns, and now they would have their final ally. Perhaps it would be Johnny who led them on that day, as the omen seemed to prophesy. He was the son of a line of leaders, born to a mother who had fought and killed a unicorn. He had gone hungry to share what little he had with the young of Ragnarok's most proud and savage species, and Fenrir and Segan would fight beside him on the day he led the forces of the Hellworld in the battle with the Gurns, who thought they were gods. Could the Gurns hope to have a leader to match? Part 4 John Humboldt, leader, stood on the wide stockade wall and watched the lowering sun touch the western horizon, far south of where it had set when he was a child. Big summer was over, and now, in the year 200, they were already three years into big fall. The Craigs had been impassable with snow for five years, and the country at the north end of the plateau, where the iron had been found, had been buried under never-melting snow and growing glaciers for twenty years. There came the soft tinkling of ceramic bells as the herd of milk goats came down off the hills. Two children were following, and six prowlers walked with them, to protect them from wild unicorns. There were not many of the goats. 
Each year the winters were longer, requiring the stocking of a larger supply of hay. The time would come when the summers would be so short and the winters so long that they could not keep goats at all. And by then, when big winter had closed in on them, the summer seasons would be too short for the growing of the orange corn. They would have nothing left but the hunting. They had, he knew, reached and passed the zenith of development of their environment. From a low of forty-nine men, women, and children in dark caves, they had risen to a town of six thousand. For a few years they had had a way of life that was almost a civilization, but the inevitable decline was already under way. The years of frozen sterility of big winter were coming, and no amount of determination or ingenuity could alter them. Six thousand would have to live by hunting, and one hundred, in the first big winter, had found barely enough game. They would have to migrate in one of two different ways. They could go to the south as nomad hunters, or they could go to other, fairer worlds in ships they took from the Gurns. The choice was very easy to make, and they were almost ready. In the workshop at the farther edge of town, the hyperspace transmitter was nearing completion. The little smelter was waiting to receive the lathe and other iron and steel and turn them into the castings for the generator. Their weapons were ready, the mockers were trained, the prowlers were waiting, and in the massive corral beyond town forty half-tame unicorns trampled the ground and hated the world, wanting to kill something. They had learned to be afraid of Ragnarok men, but they would not be afraid to kill Gurns. The children with the goats reached the stockade and two of the prowlers, Fenrir and Segen, turned to see him standing on the wall. He had made a little motion with his hand, and they came running, to leap up beside him on the ten-foot-high wall. "'So, you've been checking up on how well the young ones guard the children?' he asked. Sagan lolled out her tongue, and her white teeth grinned at him in answer. Fenrir, always the grimmer of the two, made a sound in his throat in reply. Prowlers developed something like a telepathic rapport with their masters, and could sense their thoughts and understand relatively complex instructions. Their intelligence was greater, and of a far more mature order, than that of the little mockers, but their vocal cords were not capable of making the sounds necessary for speech. He rested his hands on their shoulders, where their ebony fur was frosted with gray. Age had not yet affected their quick, flowing movement, but they were getting old. They were only a few weeks short of his own age. He could not remember when they had not been with him. Sometimes it seemed to him he could remember those hungry days when he and Fenrir and Segen shared together in his mother's lap, but it was probably only his imagination from having heard the story told so often. But he could remember for certain when he was learning to walk, and Fenrir and Segen, full-grown then, walked tall and black beside him. He could remember playing with Segen's pups, and he could remember Segen watching over them all sometimes giving her pups a bath and his face a washing with equal disregard for their and his protests. Above all, he could remember the times when he was almost grown, the wild, free days when he and Fenrir and Segen had roamed the mountains together. With a bow and a knife and two prowlers beside him, he had felt that there was nothing on Ragnarok that they could not conquer that there was nothing in the universe they could not defy together. There was a flicker of black movement, and a young messenger prowler came running from the direction of the council hall, a speckle-faced mocker clinging to its back. It leaped up on the wall beside him, and the mocker, one that had been trained to remember and repeat messages verbatim, took a breath so deep that its cheeks bulged out. It spoke, in a quick rush like a child that is afraid it might forget some of the words. Will you please come to the council hall to lead the discussion regarding the last preparations for the meeting with the Gurns? The transmitter is completed. The lathe was torn down the next day, and the smelter began to roar with its forced draft. Excitement and anticipation ran through the town like a fever. It would take perhaps twenty days to build the generator, 
working day and night so that not an hour of time would be lost, forty days for the signal to reach Athena, and forty days for the Gurn cruiser to reach Ragnarok. In one hundred days the Gurns would be there. The men who would engage in the fight for the cruiser quit trimming their beards. Later, when it was time for the Gurns to appear, they would discard their woolen garments for ones of goatskin. The Gurns would regard them as primitive inferiors at best, and it might be of advantage to heighten the impression. It would make the awakening of the Gurns a little more shocking. An underground passage, leading from the town to the concealment of the woods in the distance, had long ago been dug. Through it the women and children would go when the Gurns arrived. There was a level area of ground, just beyond the south wall of town, where the cruiser would be almost certain to land. The town had been built with that thought in mind. Woods were not far from both sides of the landing site, and unicorn corrals were hidden in them. From the corrals would come the rear flanking attack against the Gurns. The prowlers, of course, would be scattered among all the forces. The generator was completed and installed on the nineteenth night. Charlie Craig, a giant of a man whose red beard gave him a genially murderous appearance, opened the valve of the water pipe. The new wooden turbine stirred and belts and pulleys began to spin. The generator hummed, the needles of the dials climbed, flickered, and steadied. Norman Lake looked from them to Humboldt, his pale gray eyes coldly satisfied. "'Full output,' he said. "'We have the power we need this time.' Jim Chiara was at the transmitter, and they waited while he threw switches and studied dials. Every component of the transmitter had been tested, but they had not had the power to test the complete assembly. "'That's it,' he said at last, looking up at them. She's ready, after almost two hundred years of wanting her. Humboldt wondered what the signal should be, and saw no reason why it should not be the same one that had been sent out with such hope a hundred and sixty-five years ago. All right, Jim, he said. Let the Gurns know we're waiting for them. Make it Ragnarok calling again. The transmitter key rattled, and the all-wave signal that the Gurns could not fail to receive went out at a velocity of five light-years a day. Ragnarok calling! Ragnarok calling! Ragnarok calling! It was the longest summer Humboldt had ever experienced. He was not alone in his impatience. Among all of them the restlessness flamed higher as the slow days dragged by making it almost impossible to go about their routine duties. The gentle mockers sensed the anticipation of their masters for the coming battle, and they became nervous and apprehensive. The prowlers sensed it, and they paced about the town in the dark of night, watching, listening, on ceaseless guard against the mysterious enemy their masters waited for. Even the unicorns seemed to sense what was coming, and they rumbled and squealed in their corrals at night, red-eyed with the lust for blood, and sometimes attacking the log walls with blows that shook the ground. The interminable days went their slow succession, and summer gave way to fall. The hundredth day dawned, cold and gray, with the approach of winter, the day of the Gurns. But no cruiser came that day, nor the next. He stood again on the stockade wall in the evening of the third day, Fenrir and Segan beside him. He listened for the first dim, distant sound of the Gurn cruiser, and heard only the moaning of the wind around him. Winter was coming. Always on Ragnarok, winter was coming, or the brown death of summer. Ragnarok was a harsh and barren prison, and no amount of desire could ever make it otherwise. Only the coming of a Gurn cruiser could ever offer them the bloody, violent opportunity to regain their freedom. But what if the cruiser never came? It was a thought too dark and hopeless to be held. They were not asking a large favor of fate, after two hundred years of striving for it, only the chance to challenge the Gurn Empire with bows and knives. 
Fenrir stiffened, the fur lifting on his shoulders and a muted growl coming from him. Then Humboldt heard the first whisper of sound, a faint, faraway roaring that was not the wind. He watched and listened, and the sound came swiftly nearer, rising in pitch and swelling in volume. Then it broke through the clouds, tall and black and beautifully deadly. It rode down on its rockets of flame, filling the valley with its thunder, and his heart hammered with exultation. It had come. The cruiser had come. He turned and dropped the ten feet to the ground inside the stockade. The warning signal was being sounded from the center of town, a unicorn horn that gave out the call they had used in the practice alarms. Already the women and children would be hurrying along the tunnels that led to the temporary safety of the woods beyond the town. The Gurns might use their turret blasters to destroy the town and all in it before the night was over. There was no way of knowing what might happen before it ended. But whatever it was, it would be the action they had all been wanting. He ran to where the others would be gathering. Fenrir and Sagan loping beside him, and the horn ringing wild and savage and triumphant as it was announced the end of two centuries of waiting. The cruiser settled to earth in the area where it had been expected to land, towering high above the town with its turret blasters looking down upon the houses. Charlie Craig and Norman Lake were waiting for him on the high steps of his own house in the center of town, where the elevation gave them a good view of the ship, yet where the fringes of the canopy would conceal them from the ship's scanners. They were heavily armed, their prowlers beside them and their mockers on their shoulders. Elsewhere, under the connected rows of concealing canopies, armed men were hurrying to their prearranged stations. Most of them were accompanied by prowlers, bristling and snarling as they looked at the alien ship. A few men were deliberately making themselves visible not far away, going about unimportant tasks with only occasional and carefully disinterested glances toward the ship. They were the bait to lure the first detachment into the center of town. Well? Norman Lake asked, his pale eyes restless with his hunger for violence. There's our ship. When do we take her? Just as soon as we get them outside it, he said. We'll use the plan we first had. Wait until they send a full force to rescue the first detachment, and then we hit them with everything we have. His black, white-nosed mocker was standing in the open doorway and watching the hurrying men and prowlers with worried interest. Tip, the great-great-great-grandson of the mocker that had died with Howard Lake north of the plateau. He reached down to pick him up and set him on his shoulder, and said, Jim? The longbows are ready, Tip's treble imitation of Jim Chiara's voice answered. We'll black out their searchlights when the time comes. Andy? he asked. The last of us for this section are coming in now, Andy Taylor answered. He made his check of all the sub-leaders, then looked up to the roof to ask, All set, Jimmy? Jimmy Stevens' grinning face appeared over the edge. Ten crossbows are cocked and waiting up here. Bring us our targets. They waited while the evening deepened into near dusk. Then the airlock of the cruiser slid open and thirteen gurns emerged, the one leading them wearing the resplendent uniform of a sub-commander. There they come, he said to Lake and Craig. It looks like we'll be able to trap them in here and force the commander to send out a full-sized force. We'll all attack at the sound of the horn, and if you can hit their rear flanks hard enough with the unicorns to give us a chance to split them from this end, some of us should make it to the ship before they realize up in the control room that they should close the airlocks. Now, he looked at the Gurns who were coming straight toward the stockade wall, ignoring the gate to their right. You'd better be on your way. We'll meet again before long in the ship. Fenrir and Sagan looked from the advancing Gurns to him with question in their eyes. After Lake and Craig were gone, Fenrir growling restlessly. Pretty soon, he said to them, right now it would be better if they didn't see you. Wait inside, both of you. 
they went reluctantly inside to merge with the darkness of the interior. Only an occasional yellow gleam of their eyes showed that they were crouched to spring just inside the doorway. He called to the nearest unarmed man, not loud enough to be heard by the Gurns. "'Cliff, you and Sam Anders come here. Tell the rest to fade out of sight and get armed.' Cliff Schroeder passed the command along, and he and Sam Anders approached. He looked back at the Gurns and saw they were within a hundred feet of the, for them, unscalable wall of the stockade. They were coming without hesitation. A pale blue beam lashed down from one of the cruiser's turrets, and a fifty-foot section of the wall erupted into dust with a sound like thunder. The wind swept the dust aside in a gigantic cloud, and the Gurns came through the gap, looking neither to the right nor left. "'That, I suppose,' Sam Anders said from beside him, "'was lesson number one for degenerate savages like us. Gurns, like gods, are not to be hindered by man-made barriers.' The Gurns walked with a peculiar gait that puzzled him, until he saw what it was. They were trying to come with the arrogant military stride affected by the Gurns, and in the 1.5 gravity they were succeeding in achieving only a heavy clumping. They advanced steadily, and as they drew closer he saw that in the right hand of each Gurn soldier was a blaster, while in the left hand of each could be seen the metallic glitter of chains. Schroeder smiled thinly. It looks like they want to subject about a dozen of us to some painful questioning. No one else was any longer in sight, and the Gurns came straight toward the three on the steps. They stopped forty feet away at a word of command from the officer, and Gurns and Ragnarok men exchanged silent stares. The faces of the Ragnarok men bearded and expressionless, the faces of the Gurns hairless and reflecting a contemptuous curiosity. "'Narth!' the communicator on the Gurn officer's belt spoke with metallic authority. "'What do they look like? Did we come two hundred light-years to view some animated vegetables?' "'No, Commander,' Narth answered. "'I think the discard of the rejects two hundred years ago has produced for us an unexpected reward.' There are three natives under the canopy before me, and their physical perfection and complete adaptation to this hellish gravity is astonishing. They could be used to replace expensive machines on some of the outer world mines, the commander said, providing their intelligence isn't too abysmally low. What about that? They can surely be taught to perform simple manual labor, Narth answered. Get on with your job the commander said. Try to pick some of the most intelligent-looking ones for questioning. I can't believe these cattle sent that message, and they're going to tell us who did. And pick some young, strong ones for the medical staff to examine, ones that won't curl up and die after the first few cuts of the knife. "'We'll chain these three first, Narth said. He lifted his hand in an imperious gesture to Humboldt and the other two, and ordered an accented Terran— "'Come here!' No one moved, and he said again sharply, "'Come here!' Again no one moved, and the minor officer beside Narth said, "'Apparently they can't even understand Terran now.' "'Then we'll give them some action they can understand,' Narth snapped, his face flushing with irritation. "'We'll drag them out by their heels!' The Gurns advanced purposefully, three of them holstering their blasters to make their chains ready. When they had passed under the canopy and could not be seen from the ship, Humboldt spoke. "'All right, Jimmy.' The Gurns froze in mid-stride, suspicion flashing across their faces. "'Look up on the roof,' he said in Gurn. They looked, and the suspicion became gaping dismay. "'You can be our prisoners, or you can be corpses,' he said. We don't care which. The urgent hiss of Narth's command broke their indecision. Kill them! Six of them tried to obey, bringing up their blasters in movements that seemed curiously heavy and slow, as though the gravity of Ragnarok had turned their arms to wood. 
three of them almost lifted their blasters high enough to fire at the steps in front of them before arrows went through their throats. The other three did not get that far. Narth and the remaining six went rigid, motionless, and said to them, "'Drop your blasters! Quick!' Their blasters thumped to the ground, and Jimmy Stevens and his bowmen slid off the roof. Within a minute the Gurns were bound with their own chains, but for the officer, and the blasters were in the hands of the Ragnarok men. Jimmy looked down the row of Gurns and shook his head. "'So, these are Gurns?' he said. "'It was like trapping a band of woods goats.' "'Young ones,' Schroeder amended, "'and almost as dangerous.' Narth's face flushed at the words, and his eyes went to the ship. The sight of it seemed to restore his courage, and his lips drew back in a snarl. "'You fools! You stupid, megalomaniac dung-heaps! Do you think you can kill Gurns and live to boast about it?' "'Keep quiet,' Humboldt ordered, studying him with curiosity. Narth, like all the Gurns, was different from what they had expected. It was true the Gurns had strode into their town with an attempt at arrogance, but they were harmless in appearance, soft of face and belly, and the snarling of the red-faced Narth was like the bluster of a cornered scavenger rodent. "'I promise you this,' Narth was saying viciously. "'If you don't release us and return our weapons this instant, I'll personally oversee the extermination of you and every savage in this village, with the most painful death science can contrive, and I'll—' Humboldt reached out his hand and flicked Narth under the chin. Narth's teeth cracked loudly together, and his face twisted with the pain of a bitten tongue. "'Tie him up, Jess,' he said to a man near him. "'If he opens his mouth again, shove your foot in it.' He spoke to Schroeder. We'll keep three of the blasters and send two to each of the other front groups. Have that done. Dusk was deepening into darkness, and he called Chiara again. They'll turn on their searchlights any minute and make the town as light as day, he said. If you can keep them blacked out until some of us have reached the ship, I think we'll have won. They'll be kept blacked out, Chiara said, with some flint-headed arrows left over for the Gurns. He called Lake and Craig to be told they were ready and waiting. "'But we're having hell keeping the unicorns quiet,' Craig said. "'They want to get to killing something.' He pressed the switch of the communicator, but it was dead. They had, of course, transferred to some other wavelength, so he could not hear the commands. It was something he had already anticipated. Fenrir and Segan were still obediently inside the doorway almost frantic with desire to rejoin him. He spoke to them, and they bounded out, snarling at the three gurns in passing and causing them to blanch to a dead-white color. He set Tip on Sagan's shoulders and said, "'Sagan, there's a job for you and Tip to do. A dangerous job. Listen, both of you.' The yellow eyes of Sagan and the dark eyes of the little mocker looked into his as he spoke to them, and accompanied his words with the strongest, clearest mental images he could project. Sagan, take Tip to the not-men thing. Leave him hidden in the grass to one side of the big hole in it. Tip, you wait there. When the not-men come out, you listen, and tell what they say. Now, do you both understand? Sagan made a sound that meant she did, but Tip clutched at his wrist with little paws suddenly gone cold, and wailed, "'No! Scared! Scared!' "'You have to go, Tip,' he said, gently disengaging his wrist. "'And Sagan will hide near to you and watch over you,' he spoke to Sagan. "'When the horn calls, you run back with him.' Again she made the sound signifying understanding, and he touched them both in what he hoped would not be the last farewell. "'All right, Sagan. Go now.' She vanished into the gloom of coming night." Tip hanging tightly to her. Fenrir stood with the fur lifted on his shoulders and a half-snarl on his face as he watched her go and watched the place where the not-men would appear. "'Where's Freckles?' he asked Jimmy. "'Here,' someone said, and came forward with Tip's mate. 
He set Freckles on his shoulder and the first searchlight came on, shining down from high up on the cruiser. It lighted up the area around them in harsh white brilliance, its reflection revealing the black shadow that was Sagan just vanishing behind the ship. Two more searchlights came on to illuminate the town. Then the Gurns came. They poured out through the airlock and down the ramp, there to form in columns that marched forward as still more Gurns hurried down the ramp behind them. The searchlights gleamed on their battle helmets and on the blades of the bayonets affixed to their rifle-like long-range blasters. Hand blasters and grenades hung from their belts, together with stubby flame guns. They were a solid mass reaching halfway to the stockade before the last of them, the commanding officers, appeared. One of them stopped at the foot of the ramp to watch the advance of the punitive force and give the frightened but faithful tip the first words to transmit to Freckles. "'The full force is on its way, Commander.' A reply came in Freckles' simulation of the metallic tones of a communicator. The key numbers of the confiscated blasters have been checked, and the disturbance rays of the master integrator set. You'll probably have few natives left alive to take as prisoners after those thirteen charges explode, but continue with a mopping-up job that the survivors will never forget. So the Gurns could, by remote control, set the total charges of stolen blasters to explode upon touching the firing stud? It was something new since the days of the old ones. He called Chiara and the other groups quickly to tell them what he had learned. We'll get more blasters, ones they can't know the numbers of, when we attack, he finished. He took the blaster from his belt and laid it on the ground. The front ranks of the Gurns were almost to the wall by then, a column wider than the gap that had been blasted through it, coming with silent purposefulness. Two blaster beams lanced down from the turrets to smash at the wall. Dust billowed and thunder rumbled as they swept along. A full three hundred feet of the wall had been destroyed when they stopped, and the dust hid the ship and made dim glows of the searchlights. It had no doubt been intended to impress them with the might of the Gurns, but in doing so it hid the Ragnarok forces from the advancing Gurns for a few seconds. "'Jim, black out their lights before the dust clears,' he called. "'Joe, the horn, we attack now!' The first longbow arrow struck a searchlight, and its glow grew dimmer as the arrow's burden, a thin tube of thick lance-tree ink, splattered against it. Another followed. Then the horn rang out, harsh and commanding, and in the distance a unicorn screamed in answer. The savage cry of a prowler came, like a sound to match, and the attack was on. He ran with Fenrir beside him, and to his left and right ran the others with their prowlers. The Lee groups converged as they went through the wide gap in the wall. They ran on into the dust cloud, and the shadowy forms of the Gurns were suddenly before them. A blaster beam cut into them, and a Gurn shouted, "'The natives!' Other beams sprang into life, winking like pale blue eyes through the dust and killing all they touched. The beams dropped as the first volley of arrows tore through the massed front ranks, to be replaced by others. They charged on, into the blue winking of the blasters and the red lances of the flame guns, with the crossbows rattling and strumming in answer." The prowlers lunged and fought beside them and ahead of them. Black hell creatures that struck the Gurns too swiftly for blasters to find before throats were torn out. The sound of battle turned into a confusion of raging snarls, frantic shouts, and dying screams. A prowler shot past him to join Fenrir, Sagan, and he felt Tip dart up to his shoulder. He made a sound of greeting in passing, a sound that was gone as her jaws closed on a gurn. The dust cloud cleared a little, and the searchlights looked down on the scene. No longer brilliantly white, but shining through the red-black lance-tree ink as a blood-red glow. A searchlight turret slid shut and opened a moment later, the light wiped clean. The longbows immediately transformed it into a red glow. The beam of one of the turret blasters stabbed down, to blaze a trail of death through the battle. 
it ceased as its own light revealed to the Gurn commander that the Ragnarok forces were so intermixed with the Gurn forces that he was killing more Gurns than Ragnarok men. By then, the fighting was so hand-to-hand -hand that knives were better than crossbows. The Gurns fell like harvested corn. Too slow and awkward to use their bayonets against the faster Ragnarok men, and killing as many of one another as men when they tried to use their blasters and flame guns. From the rear there came the command of a Gurn officer, shouted high and thin above the sound of battle. Back to the ship! Leave the natives for the ship's blasters to kill! The unicorns arrived then to cut off their retreat. End of Episode 11